Today I am going to be reviewing The Lord of Chaos, which is book six in the Wheel of Time series. I have reviews for all five books before this one. You should check them out if you've read them. If you haven't read any of these, you should leave because this is going to be spoiler filled. So I just kind of wrote down some thoughts and some main points uh, throughout this book. And I'm gonna try to go off of that. I think I'm good. I really don't know how to do this review because I have such mixed feelings about this book. Once again, great ending, but I didn't enjoy reading this book nearly as much as the others before it. And I have, I, I guess I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, great ending and a few nice moments throughout, but for the most part, I didn't love reading this one until the end, so. Let's talk about it. Let's just go into some of the events that I want to chat about and then we'll kind of get to that part at the end. Pretty, I want to say pretty early on, but really it was more like at the halfway point that uh, Nynaeve healed Loghain, um, which was... <laughs> so Nynaeve <laughs> repeatedly is the most powerful uh, Aes Sedai as long as she's really angry, which I guess is funny because Nynaeve's personality trait is being a brat. She is constantly irritated and snapping at people for regularly not really good reasons. Um, and it is funny that she doesn't want to be powerful, but the thing that gives her power is the thing that she can't get past. Like she can't control her anger and frustration and emotions and not being able to control this is what gives her her power. I kind of, I, I do find that that dynamic really funny, but she is starting to rein it in a little bit. She can now heal uh, gentling, which I mean, is a massively big deal. Um, actually, as soon as that happened, I thought, ooh, so does that mean that at some point Rand is gonna be gentled and then Ny Nynaeve is gonna heal him? I wonder if that's gonna happen at some point in the story. But anyway, that was a big shock and a very interesting twist. And I expect, I don't trust Loghain. I don't know if I'm supposed to. I really don't know very much about Loghain at all, but I definitely don't trust him. And I expect him having his powers back is not going to be a positive in this world, which we'll come back to. Something that kind of confused me was the the stuff with the Ogier. So, once again, in the Ogier culture, as well as in the Aes Sedai and human and every culture in this series, the women seem to be the ones that kind of just push the men around. So, um, uh, loyal, gosh, loyal's um, mom and betrothed show up and they decide for loyal what his future will be. Um, and then Rand kind of tells them, okay, I'll bring you to Loyal as long as you show me where the way gates are because he wants to destroy them because the shadow uses the way gates to move their armies because the shadow spawn can't go through the way gates, which is something that maybe you guys can explain to me because I really didn't understand why shadow spawn can't go through them. It might've been something that I missed. There's a lot going on with this series. And like I've mentioned in a previous review, uh, because there are so many little details happening throughout the magic and the world, I kind of, in this read through, am just trying to get big picture things. And then the little details, I'm letting slip by a little bit easier. And then if I love the series enough to go back and reread it someday, then hopefully I'll pick up on some of these small things. So maybe this is just something I missed. Let me know if you can explain it to me. Egwene and Gawain. Okay, so Egwene, I'm gonna talk about Egwene for a minute. Um, first of all, her going into sort of the dream world, but a little bit different, being able to experience other people's dreams. And then she finds out that Gowan is in love with her. And then she randomly, abruptly decides, yeah, me too. Um, this is another just testament of, of what I've said repeatedly throughout these reviews, that romantic relationships are just not Jordan's strong suit, which is no big deal because that's not the focus of his series. But it's also kind of a big deal because even though it's not the focus of his series, he does spend a good amount of time having characters fall in love with each other. And it's almost always abrupt, jarring, and unconvincing, in my opinion. I think Nynaeve and Lan are the most convincing coupling and yet Jordan is stringing us along for that for so long and barely even including Lan in the books, even though he's one of the coolest characters. But this is another instance and maybe the worst instance so far of 
what I would call insta-love because where did this even come from? But um, on that note, should I jump to Perrin? Probably not. I'm trying to section these off by characters. Um, but I do, I do think that Jordan seems to do a good job after he's thrown couples together abruptly, quickly, not really with any explanation. After they're together, he does seem to build on them and convince me of them later on. Perrin and Fahil are an example of that, but I'm gonna talk more about Perrin in a bit. Anyway, Egwene became the new Amelin, uh, Armelin, Amelin seat. I'm sorry, I really don't know how to pronounce anything. Anyway, that's a huge deal and was quite a surprise. I get it because they're trying to manipulate her and they're trying to find somebody who's worthless so that they can push her around. And Egwene has been worthless for a little while. The last few books, she's served such no purpose. She served no purpose. Um, and now suddenly we're probably gonna get a little bit of purpose out of her. I liked that she saw that she was being manipulated and essentially decided, I get what you're doing here and I'm going to take the opportunity, but I'm not gonna let you do the thing. I hope she follows through with that and I hope she ends up being a really cool character. I'm ready for her character to be something again. And I did like that pretty much as soon as she gets her new position, she, who is it? It's Elaine and Nynaeve that she makes full Aes Sedai, which is, Awesome. Uh, let's move on to Rand next, because he's probably the one that I'm the most excited to talk about. His arc, his storyline, was definitely the most interesting in this book to me. I really don't think that much happened with anybody in this book, but Rand's development was really cool. Rand decides that instead of going along with this idea that men shouldn't channel because it'll drive them insane and also men just aren't allowed to have any agency in this world, um, he decides to ch teach men to channel. He, he basically comes up with a training camp and he teaches them to do the thing that no one's allowed to do, which is interesting and cool, but also terrifying because the magic of this world is still tainted, yeah? So these men that he's training up are kind of, they're all gonna go insane like him, right? Again, unless I miss something, but the whole time he's training them up, I'm thinking, okay, I like, I like your idea here, but consequences, seems like there's gonna be big ones. Oh, and then there was that scene with um, Elena is maybe how you pronounce that name. Uh, the one Aes Sedai chick that bonded, mentally bonded with him. What's that called? I can't remember the term. Maybe it's just bonding. But she mentally bonded with Rand without his consent, which what's gonna come from that? That's a huge deal. I didn't even know you could do that without it being a two-way bond. But how did she think she would get away with that? Like the audacity. And then he essentially throws her up against a wall, screams at her and tells her he's gonna kill her if she doesn't leave right now. Which again, fill me in here if I miss something, but it seems like he should have killed her. And I, I, I know Rand's a good guy sometimes and he doesn't wanna kill people sometimes. So I, I get that, like life isn't so easily, easily snuffed out, but also she still has power over him. She still, didn't she try to manipulate him? Like try to, take away his free will in that moment, she still has the power to be trying to do that and maybe she will. And I have a feeling that she's going to be a weapon in future books. We're gonna see her come back and there are gonna be repercussions because once again, Rand didn't kill someone. And sometimes there's a situation where they, something needs to happen here because it seems like this is gonna have big consequences. Then Rand essentially gets uh, captured and ta tortured every single day, brutally horribly. It's terrible. They even at one point start torturing men to just make it worse for Rand. This book is very brutal. That's another thing. Um, Egwene, after it's found out that she's been doing something that she's not supposed to, they beat her up. They, they beat her before they rise her and raise her in the ranks. And, and this book is, there's a lot of beatings or torture. Like there's a lot of really disturbing stuff that goes on in this book. It, it's definitely being 
there's a lot of consequences happening to these these sweet characters that I've been following from the two rivers. So Rand's going through daily torture. Min even has to go through some torture because of his relationship with her. And then also Rand, oh my gosh, I loved the dynamic between him and Luce Theron in this book. Uh, Luce Theron is really trying to take over Rand's thoughts, not really take over, but just doesn't even realize that that he's not in the forefront and he keeps trying to respond to things and keeps trying to have a will of his own and Rand basically keeps shoving him down and saying shut up um, and then by the end they sort of work together and start communicating and Luce Theron becomes cognizant that Rand and he are separate yet to yet the same entity um, and I love that dynamic and I am so excited to see that play out. Rand is such a wild card where he's becoming more and more powerful while also becoming more and more unhinged. And I just, I just, I'm, I wanna know. I wanna know where it's gonna go. Also speaking of Min, I really like her character a lot. Uh, I love the friendship she has with Rand. I think it's hilarious the way she's messing with him because of that dumb thing he said about like, I don't remember, I don't, I don't think of you like a girl or something and then she just started messing with him and like making him feel awkward and, and a flutter. Min is one of my favorite female characters for sure at this point. Okay, let's, let's jump to Perrin. So y'all lied to me. Um, I was complaining in the last book about how Perrin took control in book four and was amazing and then in book five he basically just didn't exist anymore um, and then and then I was I was ready for more Perrin and multiple people told me, don't worry, Perrin is, is gonna be great and relevant and all over book six again. And what a lie. <laughs> Perrin doesn't show up until about the last 200 pages. So I got about 800 pages without him. But when he does show up, he's amazing. He steals the show. He's my favorite character still. I love him so much. Perrin's love for Fael in this book is adorable. And this is one of the things that I was talking about where Perrin and Fael's relationship I didn't like the buildup for, they were bickering off and on and they clearly liked each other, especially Perrin because he was constantly saying, I don't like her, I don't like her, I don't like her. And it was obviously him saying, like arguing with himself. And then suddenly after one grand gesture, they were they were in love and then they were married. So I didn't like their buildup, their relationship, I had a hard time getting on board with, but I'm down with it now because of Perrin's love for Fael. Not because of Fael, she's still not terribly likable. She basically spent this entire book being jealous and nothing else. She didn't really serve any purpose at all, but she did make herself even less likable. Um, but Perrin, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with this coupling because I really appreciated um, how much he fought for her with the in-laws and um, how much, how patient he was uh, in, in all that and even defensive at one point in his mind, he's constantly saying, okay, I know Fael's jealous, so I just need to like be careful and make sure that everything looks safe and she never walks in, in an awkward situation, which doesn't work out. Um, and then at one point when somebody says, yeah, Fael's really jealous, Perrin's like, no, she's not. Like he, I love, I love his devotion to her. And then of course, at the end, when um, he basically, oh man, he, he fully embraces his powers with the wolves. He calls them into action, this thing that he's been avoiding all this time. When it comes time that he needs to stand up and fight again, he fully embraces it, he goes for it, and he even goes for the things that he's been avoiding because he knows it's what needs to be done. And I love it. Perrin's also had a lot of growth, but even from book four to now, um, he's still experienced more growth because in book four, he was super hesitant to take charge and be a leader. And then by now, when we catch up with him again, he's just like, time for us to rise let's rise. And I appreciated that little glimpse into his growth, even though he did not get enough page time. I appreciated the page time at the end, but I could have used about 800 more pages because he's one of the best characters. Before we get into the final battle a little bit more, um, I do want to talk about a couple of things. So one thing that I'm not loving about this series is we have such a massive cast that Jordan doesn't really attempt to balance very much. He essentially dedicates some books to some characters and other books to other characters. And if this book isn't gonna focus on that character, they're either not gonna be in the book or they're going to be there, but they're not gonna serve any sort of purpose. Um, Loyal showed up, but 
only for some cameos. He really didn't serve any purpose here. Tom didn't serve any purpose. Fael didn't serve any purpose. Egwene, we got some setup for some purpose she'll serve later, but she didn't really serve any purpose. Elaine didn't serve any purpose. Um, even Matt was barely worth following in this book. We got a little bit of Matt. We saw him Here's gamble. The <laughs> the why? Why do you listen to me? And why do you speak to me when I'm not talking to you? Wow. Some setup for purpose she'll serve later, but Shin really serve any purpose. Elaine didn't. Wow, 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 wow. You've been listening for a long time. What was I saying? Matt. Matt. Oh yeah, he was gambling. He took on a little a little kid comrade and uh, he learned a lot of dance moves, <laughs> but he wasn't very interesting in this book at all. Um, so that's one thing that's a bummer is if you're not interested in the books that, if you're not interested in the characters that a book is focused on, it's a bummer because th there's so many characters, but a lot of them just get dropped from book to book. The other thing I'm not digging, so I've brought this up many times, so I'm not gonna go on another rant about how frustrating I find the women in the series. I get what Jordan was trying to do, I get that he was trying to make the women empowered in, in, a, in a genre that a lot of times was definitely male-leaning and he tried to flip the script, but he, didn't, he did it in a way that made it look like women shouldn't be leading because they're so obnoxious about it. Um, I've complained about this a lot. I've complained about how awful these women treat the men and how much they basically just want the men to sit in a corner and not talk. And it's growing and it's getting better and y'all have promised me multiple times that it's going to only get better from here. There's a lot of character growth. It's just a very slow and steady growth and I'm super excited for that. Let's talk about something new that happened in this book, in that same thread. I do not like the relationship that's building around Rand. So Elaine, okay, Elaine, um, what's her name? I haven't even mentioned her in this whole review. The one that had igloo sex. Y'all know who I'm talking about. That one and, uh, and Min have all decided together that they're going to share Rand. <sighs> okay. Here's why I don't like it. I don't like it because they're not asking Rand. It's the same nonsense. The women have decided that they wanna be sister lives, wives and they want to all marry Rand and they wanna dictate how this relationship is gonna go, but they don't even check in with him about it. They still have this mentality of, we'll decide what's going to happen and then we'll tell Rand what his future is and it doesn't matter what he thinks. And I just hate that relationship dynamic. That is so messed up. They don't care about Rand's consent one iota, or at least that's how it's looking now. We haven't seen them confront him about it. So maybe that'll change. But as of right now, it's not looking pretty because once again, they've decided how they're going to handle their relationship and then he will just be a good boy and not his head. And it doesn't matter what he wants. It doesn't matter what he thinks. They've, they've made that clear throughout this entire series. You belong to Elaine, you belong to Elaine, you belong to Elaine. And he's like, I don't know if I wanna belong to Elaine. And they're like, shut up, you belong to Elaine. And now they've decided, well, you belong to all of us. And what's gonna happen here? Is he gonna say, I don't know that I want that. And they're gonna say, shut up, here's what's happening because that's what's been going on so far. And that's such a terrible relationship dynamic. And I know it's not like Jordan is trying to paint a, pic a picture perfect relationship. Like that's not his purpose. He's not trying to say, here kids, here's how you do relationships or anything. But like, I already don't like the power dynamics in this world. And now you're going to try to sell me on this situation with the same power dynamics. You're not even gonna do that one. I just, ugh, I'm not, I'm not on board. I've had a few people say that it, it seems weird, but once you get there, it ends up working. I, I will see. I will keep reading and we will see. As of right now, I am not sold. Okay, diving into the final battle. So that was wild. So essentially, um, oh man, I'm not gonna remember any of these names. So basically the Ashaman, Ashaman, is that how you say it? Show up and so Perrin's army shows up and then the Ashaman army shows up and the Ashaman channel and it is, so disturbingly brutal. What is it? Does he say blender? Is that the word he uses? He basically talks about blending people. That's what this channeling does. So it is a, whew, it's a slaughter and it is rough. Like it is brutal. A lot happened in that battle. 
and holy cow. <laughs> and then after it was done, and it was, it was Robert Jordan, he does his battle sequences very well. He is very consistent with having a very mild and tame story, which he didn't entirely do this time because of all the torture, uh, but he is very consistent with having things pretty chill, a very much walk pace for 800 pages. And then the final, se the final sequence is when we're in an all out sprint. And um, the final battle was wild. I read it twice because the first time I was just kind of caught up in it. And then I was talking to my friend Noshi and um, I felt like a couple things went over my head. And so he encouraged me to go back and reread it. So I reread it and I feel like I was grasping a little bit more of what was going on there. I might even read it again. I don't know. But that's definitely something, one of Jordan's strengths is these final battle sequences. Rand essentially had the, the Aes Sedai that are now prisoners swear fealty to him like they don't have a choice. He he basically threatened them, swear fealty to me or all, all these horrible things are gonna happen to you. And so they begrudgingly do. And then the traitor Aes Sedai, the rebel Aes Sedai, um, they don't like it. And so Rand's like, you two, swear fealty to me or else. So they do. And now Rand sort of um, forced his way into this position of, the biggest power, like he he's more powerful than anybody now. And I don't know, I don't know. I'm very curious because Rand has had a lot of power in this book and his ability, his uh, actions with that power have been really interesting to watch. And now he suddenly went from here all the way up to here. And I'm just very curious what that's gonna look like in the next book. I hope we don't lose Rand again. In The Dragon Reborn, he essentially wasn't in the book. Let's not do that again, because he's finally interesting after all this time. He's finally one of the most interesting characters. So let's not lose him again, Jordan. Oh yeah, and then the epilogue where Egwene um, in, you know, all good intentions, frees Loghain, which I don't trust the man. Like I don't foresee this going well. I don't think Loghain, I have a feeling that Loghain is going to cause a lot of problems. We'll see but I just have a feeling that this <laughs> sweet Egwene, you tried, but I don't think this is gonna go well. But I also don't know, cause I don't know a ton about Loghain. We haven't spent a lot of time getting to know him, so we'll see, but I'm, I'm placing my bets now. Okay, so that's me kind of hitting the key points that I found interesting or frustrating throughout the book. Um, another general thing that I didn't mention with everything else is one thing that's really, stealing a lot of my enjoyment of reading these books is the amount of recap. Jordan is an extremely descriptive guy and wildly repetitive with those descriptions. And um, I haven't ever liked that about him, but six books in, it's starting to grate on me um, because by now I should know who the Aes Sedai are. I should understand how the magic works. I should understand most of what he's telling me. And I get that these books weren't published one after another, like I'm reading them. I get that there was space between them. And so Robert Jordan is trying to refresh everybody's memory so that they don't have to reread these books. But when 400 of your thousand pages, I think it's only a 900 page book, but when like 400 of your 900 page book or 300 pages of your 900 page book could be cut because it's unnecessary repetition, it really does make it a chore to get through. I've, I'm like with this book, it felt like, it felt like I was forcing myself to read until the final sequence. Basically once, once, once the guys came back together and had that reunion, which was awesome. I loved that scene. That's when things finally started getting interesting. And up until that point, it was like little moments that were interesting, little character growths that I enjoyed. But for the most part, this book was really a slog and I've not even hit the slog of the series yet. I do wish that Jordan had cut back on reminding everyone everything that they should know. I get, I get that he's trying to refresh people after they've had to take a break between publication dates, but once, when you're six books in, you should at least know the basics, you know? Like when you're six books in, you should at least have a foundation of memory of this world magic people. Um, but he treats us as if we don't know anything. He treats us as if, if you picked up book six 
and started there, you'd be solid. And I don't wanna be treated that way because it makes the book so much longer than it needs to be and rereading those details is boring. I still love these books. I always, at the end of a book, even one like this, where it was really a slog to read until the end, I still, at the end of the book, look back and I'm like, man, that was a great book because there's still so much character development, plot development, world development that happens in each book. And the overarching story of Wheel of Time is great, but there's so much in between that overarching story that could just be taken out and nothing would be affected. <laughs> and that really does suck. This was definitely my least favorite of the six so far. Um, except for that, the ending sequence. That ending sequence was beautiful, but the other 900 pages, like the, the other 700 pages or 750 pages of this book that were not, I didn't enjoy reading. I still love the series as a whole. I'm still gonna keep reading. I'm still gonna keep reviewing. Um, there was a lot to talk about, good and bad, and I still enjoy the series, so, you know. Don't get too offended at me, or do, it's your choice. But that's my review for The Lord of Chaos. I am going to take a break. I said I was gonna read book seven this month, but book six took me so long to read that I'm gonna give myself a break. I'm gonna focus on other things. And then December, I always dedicate the month of December to rereads, so I will pick back up on book seven in January. But feel free to keep chatting with me about things. Please don't spoil future books. I post videos every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I'll see you guys again soon, bye.